Well, it's always nice when we can take our building and turn around and look at it, make sure everything's square. Ready now to, to start work on the roof. Got a nice dilapidated siding. We've got to add the door in the back. Got to add the front door. All our interior looks really nice. So we'll begin with the doors. Now on the particular castings I had, it had these little wings that I wasn't terribly crazy about, so I decided to just snip those wings off. You can leave the wings on if you want, or you just uh, it's just a very simple thing to just uh, cut them off with uh, an X-Acto knife, just like that. All there is to it. Want to do it on both sides of the door, of course. And then you just check the edge of the door, see how it feels, and smooth it out a little bit with an emery board. And there's our door frame, all ready to install. Nice and easily done. Don't even need to touch up the paint on that. It's just ready to go into place. Now when we get these castings, like the Grantline castings that I use, they come with a door, a, pl a plastic door, and it's got a nice wood grain on it and everything. And if you want, you can just simply uh, paint that door and install that. Uh, certainly uh, a good thing to do. They're very nice castings, very thin. Got a doorknob and everything. Or you can build one of your own. Now if you're going to build one of your own, first off you need to just cut some pieces of wood the same width as the door. And we're going to fabricate this just like we would a regular door. Now here for this door you can see I'm using HO scale strip wood that's one inch thick by eight inches wide. So in O scale that would be one half inch thick by four inches wide approximately. So a four inch piece of wood. Very thin like they would use on a door. Now I've got several of the pieces cut here to the width of the door. And I've got a piece of uh, scotch tape sticky side up taped down to my uh, workbench. And on these individual pieces of wood you see that I use the technique using the uh, rubber cement to get a, a very weathered look on these doors. But I didn't scratch them up an awful lot. I just wanted it to look like the paint was peeling. Popular kind of paint that was used way back when was uh, whitewash. And whitewash didn't really stick to doors very well. So uh, it frequently uh, came off. It just didn't work very well, but it was cheap, uh, and that was something that was very important. You know, people don't really realize that the the type of paints we're used to today are really a, a product of modern chemistry, that you go back 100, 150 years, and paints were altogether different. Any paints you had came from natural pigments, things that came out of the ground. Now here I've taken a piece that's going to go along the outside of the door. I've got the pieces there for the horizontal pieces that run in the body of the door. And if you want to have it open at the top, you just leave off a few of those if you want to have an area there. So I just cut a little thin strip again of the same kind of wood and I put it right there at the very edge. I want to line it up as best I can. Uh, you can always trim it, of course, later. I always do the best you can and I line it up by taking a larger piece of wood and holding it against my other pieces then pushing that flush up against that and that way I get a nice straight edge. You don't want this to be crooked. So I'll just spend a little bit of time getting it just as nicely as you can. Once you've done that take another strip of the same wood and apply the glue on the back of that and this time we're going to apply it on the, the near side of that door. It's actually how they would do it in real life. They'd take a bunch of small planks, put a couple of planks along the outside, they'd tack them together very lightly with very short little nails, and we use glue of course. Okay, once you get those two pieces on there, you want to set and let this dry. You want to set and let this dry because the next thing we're going to be doing is we're going to be adding extra cross pieces. So we cut a piece that fits right in there at the top. 
very easily done. Just fit that in place. Make sure that it comes right to the very top. And put an emery board or something there and push it up to the top. Then we want to add uh, some cross pieces at the bottom, of course. And if you look at your plastic door that come with the casting, you can you can see how these members were laid out. Okay, there's the upper part of the door and the lower part. That's really to protect those surfaces from kicking and things like that. And then we're going to put a piece right about halfway down. Now if you want to have an open or a screen door, just leave out those parts uh, that are up at the top where I'm putting this piece. You can just leave those out. And this is uh, going to be the type door. I think they call this a four panel door, meaning there's four open areas. So there we've added those. Once that has dried, uh, you just turn it over, take your tape off carefully. You don't want to pull really hard on this. You want to work it off carefully because there's not a lot of glue holding these in place. And that way we have uh, one side of the door done. So we're just going to essentially uh, repeat the same process on the other side of the door. Again, we're just going to add a little glue. Not a lot of glue, but a little glue. Can you notice on the paint there how peeled and everything it is? It just makes for a very natural looking door. The doors are one of those areas I like to scratch build the doors simply because it it just adds so much to the overall look of the building to have a scratch built door. Of course that's what we're really, this whole video is about, is about scratch building and scratch building is one of those things you either love to do or you don't. A lot of people uh, don't want to spend the time needed to do this. I work in a very small area so I don't mind spending a whole bunch of time on any particular model. When I began in the hobby, it was in the late 40s, very early 50s. At that point in time, they didn't have any castings. And if anybody made strip wood, I didn't know about it. Or if anybody made any structural shapes, I didn't know about it. I lived next to the library when I was a boy. And the librarian had a son, one son, who liked to build models. And when he got old and got married and left town she had all these half-built kits to to give to me so she would give those old wooden airplane kits to me and I found that I could take the the stringers the and use that for uh, uh, structure pieces and cut the the balsa and uh, use it to make siding and everything so I ended up uh, instead of building a lot of model airplanes, although I built a few, I ended up building structures. So I, I started doing this type of work of scratch building when I was oh, probably eight or nine years old. And I'm a little over 60 now, so I've been doing this for well over 50 years. And it's something that uh, it relaxes me. I get a lot of satisfaction from doing the work. And my skills have improved an awful lot over the years, but uh, a lot of that is just uh, everybody's skills have improved. You know, today there's so many more great materials available. There are good magazines like the Gazette, uh, lots of helpful information available to the beginning modeler that it won't take somebody 50 years to do this. I, I frequency, frequently see this quality of work and people have been in a hobby just three or four years. And of course there are people who are uh, much better at it th than I am. Uh, we all have our favorites but when it comes to building structures if you're ever at a convention or a show and you get the chance to uh, meet Dave Revelia, certainly recommend that you uh, spend some time talking to him. Brian Nolan, another man that lives in Florida, another very good model builder. And there's a guy in Nevada, Brian Block, a very good model builder. There's much more than just those three, of course, but those are three of the people whose work I really look at and admire and uh, try to, to strive towards to, to duplicate. Of course, I have a close friend who used to live up here, Max Corey, who 
as an artist and when he would build any building it would always have a very artistic flavor to it something that I've been I can build models I'm a model builder but I'm not truly an artist uh, we all use the same wood the the same paints the same tools but some of us have truly outstanding uh, finished products and some of us don't uh, mine are acceptable to me and I enjoy it and I'm content but I'm always learning I always look for opportunities to learn well we're about to get this little door finished up here at least as far as the siding goes you can see that uh, we've just done exactly the same thing on the back that we've done on the front and again once we get this all done we want to get it lined up as well as we can and make sure that everything is straight and people who build real doors build them just about as quickly as I've built this one from wood uh, they're really fast at it now of course like everything else we really want to let this dry before we go on to the next step so give it some time to to really dry well and then we're going to we're going to clean up the edges but please let it dry first cleaning up the edges is very simple it's done with uh, emery board now what I have here is I've got a little tiny piece of wood. Now this can be either wood or styrene. And this is just a, a little sliver of styrene and I'm actually going to drill a little hole in it. And this hole that I'm drilling into it is uh, for the doorknob. We're actually going to put a doorknob here. Now the item I'm going to use to make a doorknob, as you can see, that's just an ordinary straight pin but within straight pins there's actually two different types there's the kind you buy at the office supply store which has a slightly larger head and then this one that has a smaller head is one you get at a dressmaker shop and here as you can see the type wood uh, 1 8 by 1 by 1 8 in HO scale styrene works very well you can either like I said before you can either use wood or styrene and the hole we drill in it it's just big enough for that pin to just barely slide through. So we want to use a small hole. Then a real secret, you cut off the head of that pin and you get that pin centered in there just right with a tiny little bit of white glue to hold it in place. Then you let it set up and dry. That gives you your door. Your door is ready to install. As long as you've gone to the work of uh, making this one out of uh, these different materials, it's good to go ahead and install it. Sometimes I like to install them rather than closed. I like to leave the door open a little bit. By leaving the door open a little bit, it's not so much that you get to see the interior of the building, but an open door just piques a little bit of curiosity as to what is beyond that door. What's right behind that open door? Is somebody coming in? Is it just left open? You know, sometimes there might be a cat or something like that coming out of that door. Anyway, just uh, to do that, you just put the glue right along the very edge of the door and very carefully put it into place. Once you get it just right, secret again is to let this thoroughly dry. Now looking at the front door, we see that the front door is a little different because the front door has that transom up above it, the door frame. But the door is built exactly the same way. and we just put a little bit of glue. Now here on the front door of this one I'm I'm having the front door closed on this uh, but it could be left open it could be left ajar uh, you know if you're really modeling an old rundown abandoned structure you would probably model this so that instead of both hinges still holding the door in place you'd do it so that uh, one side of the door really leaned in or out or was crooked so we can just uh, go ahead and put that in. Now if you want to do it so that it's open, just put it into the doorway very carefully like this and put something to prop it open while that glue dries. A little bit of wood, something like that. That's one way to do it so that you have an open door. That way you can do it so that it dries open. Now here I'm showing you uh, how to put uh, 
cut styrene, clear styrene to fit in the windows. Some people use glass. I like styrene. I'm always afraid with glass slivers uh, getting into me. Uh, I've just am concerned about them, so I don't like to use them. Now, for fitting the window thing, the castings, I don't put them into the actual casting that's installed on the building. I take another brand new casting and cut my pieces so that they fit right on it and when they fit right on it it'll fit right on the other. So what I did was I put that inside the frame there marked it lightly and here I'm scoring it and we can just take that real thin styrene and just snap it. After you've scored it you just flex it back and forth and snap it tear it apart and that piece will then fit right in into the window. So you can do four individual panes if you want. You can take one of those panes or more of them. You can cut them or make them look damaged. Here I'm just showing you an easy way to uh, show damage. Frequently damage comes from uh, a pebble being hit or a child throws a rock at a window and it breaks and there's just a center part where the rock strikes and the cracks radiate from around it. So that's what I'm doing is here. I'm using the sharp part of the X-Acto knife and I'm just simulating those cracks. Now they can be very small. You know when you have breaks in windows it can be very small like this. That's just a very small break. So you can install it like that just to show uh, a very minor crack or chip on it. Or if you want to show more exaggerated uh, breaks you can do that too. Uh, it helps to have a very sharp blade when doing this and just have your, your cracks radiate right out to the edge of the glass. You can cut out chunks of this and just leave slivers in or you can even just have one or two slivers of glass glued into the frame of the window uh, depending upon how much uh, damage you want to have shown to the window. You can see by my shaking there a little bit I'm really pressing down on this most people don't shake quite as much as I do. I'm getting old enough to where I'm just not as strong as I used to be and so I shake quite a bit while trying to do these kind of things. There you can see all those different patterns and they radiate right to, out to the side. Now when I glue the uh, styrene into the window uh, there's lots of different ways of doing it. You can use uh, a styrene cement but sometimes it will yellow the uh, plastic so I don't like to use that. I prefer to use uh, Elmer's glue. Now here I'm pointing at the top in the rafters. Here at the top of the rafters this is where our ridge board is going to go. Our ridge beam is going to go right in there into those two notches. That's going to fit straight down into there. We can design this roof so it's uh, completely removable or you can do it so that it, it stays in place. Your choice. Now here you notice I have that beam in place and I sort of lay the first truss down and work it back and forth and lift it up. See how I lay it in there and lift it up? And you want to do this carefully. Now the spacing of these, in modern structures they build them pretty close together, but back when wood was scarce it was quite common for these to be put on uh, the spacing between these rafters to be two feet or even four feet. Uh, the house I was spent most of my life in as a child was built uh, uh, during World War II. Wood was very scarce so the spacing there on the rafters and the roof is actually four feet. So here we see that uh, we can see these pieces in place and they're right above the studs. See each piece is right above the studs below. That provides a lot of support. Now we're going to cut individual pieces to put in between these. So we just glue these pieces in place. These will all be the same length. We'll put them on one side and then we'll do the other. So you glue the first one in and just slide the next rafter up against it glue another one in place. Now when you glue these in place, if you put the glue only on these beam, these pieces that go in here and don't get it on the rafters themselves, then this will be easy to remove later. Now 
and we just continue along putting these spacers along first on this side and then we're going to switch over and we're going to do them on the other side as well now at this point that ridge beam at the very top is not glued in place uh, this and uh, there's no glue holding these rafters at the top uh, what we're doing is we're actually just using these little blocks of wood to hold uh, these rafters into place okay, well there we got a good close-up detail now this is how it looks as we're progressing along after you get one side done you switch over to the other side and you want to put the same type blocks in there. Now I work all the way back except for the very last one. That very last one has to be cut uh, individually on each side. So I, these are on four foot centers. So there's a one glued in there and we just work our way back along here. You can see this is all still very flexible at this point. Just push that up against. Once we have this whole rib assembly, roof assembly done, it'd be very easy uh, to make it a removable, and I'll show you how it removes in a few minutes. So we just continue along. So there we got the four. Uh, spacer pieces on this side and we still have that one right there it has to be custom fit as well as the one on the other side it has to be custom fit so there's that last little one going into place and switching over to the other side we got one last one to go over on this side as well. Okay. Now, this is where we depart from structural prototype. In real life, they don't aren't going to put these pieces in that I'm going to put in here next, but this is what we do if you're going to have a model that has the roof removable. This is my way of doing it to, to make it work well. At this point, the rafters are free to move back and forth. So just like I had pieces of wood down at the bottom to serve as spacers, I'm going to glue pieces of wood here that will serve as spacers as well. Now, I'm going to be very careful not to get any glue right there on that extreme right, right where that peak is, where that roof beam goes, that ridge beam goes all the way into that little notch there on the end. Make sure you don't get any glue on there. Get glue right up to it. So even that little bit of glue I'm taking off, that was a little too much glue to, to get there. Just want to get the glue right on these parts right here. And then we glue that piece in. Okay. Okay, making sure we line that up well. Now again, that's right there to the right of my fingers. It's still uh, not glued. It's just this beam, is this piece is glued in place there. Right there, there's no glue. So we've done that one, so we're going to, uh, going to add others. And we're going to pick our roof up. When we pick it up to remove it, we're going to pick it up by just by grasping these little bars along here. Okay. Now we're going to proceed along. We're going to add some more of these pieces. We're going to add them to both sides. So now I'm going to work on the other side. Put a little bit of glue down at that end. That rafter gets glued in place. But it's over on that right hand side. We want to make sure we don't get any glue at this point. And we just stick that little piece on there. And that gives us strength so we got a nice strong joint there so that rafter to the left of center is glued to these beams it all glues together well makes it very strong but that that 
little notch over at the right has no glue in it so it can slide up and down out of there. So we just want to continue on. We want to add it into the next area here. Again this is going to be the same length as the, the little spacer wood we did on the front. Here you notice I'm getting the glue on the, the rafter because we want this glued to the rafter. Doing it at that end too, getting it on the rafter and along in that opening there. and we just put that piece into place. We want to do this while the roof is still on the model. You just use the tweezers to square it up. And then we want to put a piece on the other side as well. Again, we put the glue on the rafters because we want this to be a good strong joint. Then glue right along where that piece of wood, that spacer, is going. I hope all this is really clear as to uh, exactly what I'm doing here and why I'm doing it. But this roof is going to lift out as a unit. Just do this. Very good. And squeeze that right up against it because we want a nice good fit right there. Now at this point we've worked our way down to the very end. Again these pieces are custom fit. And again we put the glue here on the right hand side so it's attached to the main set of rafters. But we don't want any glue down here at this notch on the left where my, my fingers are holding it. We don't want any glue down there. We want this unit to be able to lift in and out of here. And of course you want to take time and let all this dry thoroughly before you move to the next step of actually pulling the roof out to make sure it comes in and out. So this is all thoroughly dry at this point. Shows how our basic roof rafters are in place. And I can just carefully pull that out. Can just set that down and a little harder to put it back in but it will fit in. You got to get those to line up along there of course on both sides and the notches on the top and it will fit right back down in there just like it did before. Of course this allows by being able to remove the roof that means you can uh, detail the interior uh, if you want to do that and take it off for display or you can just go ahead and glue it in place whichever you want to do. Okay, So that's, uh, that's how it's going to look. Now we need to put some siding material on there and to do that we want to make sure that's perfectly flat. And that's something uh, before we go any further you need to make sure it's flat. Now we're going to start with a shingle roof. So what I do is I take some graph paper and I'm putting marks right there one quarter inch apart. In O scale that's one foot. If you're working in HO you'd want to put these half this distance. But one foot across and I'm using a, a type pen that the ink won't run. And then here's one of the trickier parts of putting this together and my grandson built a version of this building and this was the part that he had the very hardest time with. So here you got marks at both ends. You see it got them on the left end of the building and the right end of the building. And what we do is we take very thin pieces of wood. The exact size of this isn't really important but we're going to take very thin pieces of wood uh, and we're just going to lay these on here. We're going to line them up right over those marks. What I'm doing right there is I'm lining them up just below those marks and putting glue along there on the top so I can move that wood right up there and all those little drops of glue are lined up. And here you, the ideal way to do this is to do one or two of these at a time and let it dry thoroughly. Now here for the purpose of the video Instead of taking the time to do that, I'm going to try to do several at once and you'll see that I just end up knocking them loose. Where if you let each one dry, I like to work on two or three models at one time so that when I glue something like this on, 
I can actually let it completely dry and go work on another model and then come back and do this. So that something like this to where I've got like 12 pieces or so on each side to go, it might take me a couple of days to actually glue these pieces on. So see, here's the problem. As soon as you try, start trying to put on more than one at a time, you end up bumping into them and knocking them loose. And this is where the real frustration comes in. Now you can speed this up if you use uh, cyanacrylates. Now here you can see that what I've done is I've taken a tube of this type of glue and I've wrapped thread around it and that little bit sticking out at the very top there that's some hot stuff tubing. It's very fine tubing. I cut off a chunk about two inches long, push it down into the opening in the bottle, wrap ordinary thread around the top of the bottle, then let some of the glue get onto those threads and it sets it up and makes a nice tight bond. That way I can put on just a drop at a time. I'm putting drops right here into the base of one of my uh, bottles of paint. And here's a little strip of wood that's got just an ordinary uh, sewing needle stuck into it with the tip trimmed off, trimmed off. You can use that and actually pick up drops of glue. And to speed up this process, we can actually glue these pieces on using the ACC. Again, being it's still hard to do though, and the real secret on doing this, of course, like I say, put these pieces on, let them dry completely, and then come back and do another piece. Otherwise, you just end up uh, causing problems. But here you can see I'm just putting on a tiny bit of glue, holding that in place just for a few seconds while that sets up. And that means you can go ahead and work on the rest of the, of the building. So whether you want to use Elmer's or whether you want to use cyanacrylates, epoxy would work. Um, these are just the easiest glues that I like to use. And they work well for me. The glues are sort of funny. What works well for one person is not another. But here you see we're ending up with these rows uh, being about uh, one scale foot apart, a quarter of an inch apart. So I let the glue run in, hold it in place for a bit, then you can move on down and do the same thing further on down. Once they're tacked in place, you can go back and add little drops of glue afterwards to strengthen it. It's very important that this be a nice strong bond right here. And we just continue adding little bits. Even on those areas where we use the Elmer's glue, you can go back with cyanacrylate, put little drops on there. And once those are set up, of course, you can just work your way on down the building. Very frustrating. Very. This is the absolutely the hardest part of the building. It's easier to do when I do it when I'm not trying to demonstrate it on a video. Because then I can really get my fingers into the picture, but I'm trying to do it so that my fingers are removed far enough away that you can see what I'm I'm doing without my hands getting in the way too much. Again, just use that the end of that little blue stick uh, that I have my needle in also works well just to hold things in place. Okay, so we just proceed along like that, just adding little bits of glue. If these get a little crooked, it's not it's not the end of the world. You know, nobody's going to be sitting there really criticizing your models too much. If uh, you do, just don't let them look at your models, you know. I build models for my own enjoyment. I don't do it to satisfy other people. Uh, for a while in my hobby career, I let the opinions of other people really influence what I enjoy doing an awful lot. And I decided I was much happier just building for myself. And I do like to share my techniques and the things that I've built. I like to share it with people. And doing things like making these videos, I find this to be a, a fun, fun part of the hobby for me anyway. It's probably not for everybody, but for me I enjoy it. This is one of the more time-consuming parts of all this. Now, if you want a real weather-beaten type of um, structure here, you can actually take one of these, two of these uh, little areas and, and break the wood out. 
so there'd be like an area in which the wood is just rotten to the point that it's actually broken through later when we add the shingles you can put the shingles on in a manner so it really looks like a lot of the shingles are are missing as well so there I'm tapping on those a little bit just to make sure they're secure now here I'm pointing at the top of this you can see it's black and the reason it's black is because I find the way to clean this after a while it plugs up I keep a little candle going and just reach that tip over into that candle now there you can see that I've added one piece of wood up at the very top right at the ridge just to make for a, a good strong joint across the the top of that ridge put one on both sides but other than that I just use those little thin strips of wood and when you have those little thin strips of wood then what you want to do is you want to actually add shingles to it now shingles lots of different ways of making shingles but I take uh, 1 by 12 wood. This is O scale 1 by 12 wood and I just cut these uh, so they're approximately 18 inches long. Scale inches. Okay. See if we can get in there close and get a good view of this. What I want to do is I dip the, the shingle in the Elmer's glue a little bit and just lay it in place and hold it there with my finger and it's tacky enough that it does a fine job of holding it like that pick up another shingle right next to it now you notice there's a variation in the color of the shingles here I like that variation in color but you don't want to get carried away you don't want a checkerboard pattern here you just want to have some natural variation in colors and that's something you find with shingles this type of roof uh, I know this type of roof was pretty common in the old days um, they were just interested in getting a very basic shelter on uh, didn't have an awful lot of wood available to work with so things were pretty basic at the time so there you can see as I'm adding that next row of shingles I'm actually overlapping the joint below you always want it so that the shingle covers the joint of the the two shingles underneath it you don't want those lines to show up or it'll leak right through there so you just proceed right along with this and um, takes quite a bit of time to do this but it gives you a very nice finished look. Now I'm going to switch over and I'm going to show you the one that my grandson built. This is my grandson's model. He's 11 and he built this and you can see here that some of the boards were busted off and there's a lot of areas there uh, where shingles are missing. One this adds to the old decrepit look of it but it also allows you to reach to look down inside and see the detailing on the inside so this is something you might consider now the other side of the building we have it built and he built it so there's only one shingle missing a little bit of wear but not as bad as the other now as you uh, uh, are building more buildings you may decide that you don't want to use shingles but you want to use something more like a, a, a a roof made out of tar paper or something like that. So we're going to show you how to do a couple of these different roof treatments. Now I've removed all the strips and uh, the shingles from the earlier version and now we're going to show you how to, to do these other type of roofs and we put in a subroof. The subroof here just consists of uh, gluing strips of uh, 1 by 12s uh, to run the length of the building. This proceeds very quickly compared with the other way of doing it. We still want to be careful. We don't want huge gaps. Now in real life what they would do on something like this is if they could afford it they would put two layers. They'd put a horizontal layer like this and they'd follow it up by putting a second layer of subroofing at a at a diagonal, at a 45 degree diagonal to add strength to the roof and to also uh, provide more protection from the weather. But frequently these were uh, pretty make-do structures and so we're j on ours we're just going to have uh, the one level of roofing. So we put the glue on quite a bit and can do several of these at one time and then after we get this on on both sides then we're going to follow this up by uh, 
showing different ways of making different types of roof materials. The first one I'm going to demonstrate is something that's very common here in Alaska, but I don't know if it's common where you live or not. So uh, rather than just using this one type of uh, roofing, I'm going to show you uh, two other types as well. Now this is what we call up here as a hot mop roof. Originally what they would have done is they would have put the sub roofing on like we're doing here. Then they would have put on uh, strips of felt or tar paper. And then they would have actually heated up tar, taken a lot of hot tar and coated over the whole entire surface. Our weather here is very extreme as you know so they would need to go to extra length and with the freezing and everything and the thawing roofs here don't last very long. Uh, the materials they use now with a lot of plastics are better but the older roofs uh, just really had to be retarred frequently and when they were retarred what they ended up with was uh, this particularly distinctive roof uh, look to it that uh, we refer to here as hot mopping. I don't know what the technical term is. But I'm going to show you a type of roof that you would find here in Alaska. Now we continue to work down here just being very careful. Uh, I'm not putting the glue... Well, I guess I am reaching way down. I'm actually going to trim these end pieces a little bit later. So. Uh, and put down as much as you want to go, as far down as you want. You can go all the way to the bottom or you can leave a little bit exposed. I've always sort of liked the looks of having a little bit of those rafter ends exposed. Uh, so if they're exposed a little bit, that's fine. Main things we want to get this on so it's nice and flat. And we want it to, to dry. Now, I've done this on both sides and I'll show you a little tip I've learned on how to put a weight on something like this to, to hold it down. I've taken two video cassette cases. Most of us have video cassette cases handy. You can use any two things, but these just work out well for, for an old scale building. And what I've got is I've got the two cases pushed right up against each other. And what I'm doing is here, I'm getting some strapping tape. I'm just tearing off a length of strapping tape and I'm actually going to tape these two together on one side. Okay, I got those laying there. Here's my strapping tape. Rip off a piece and we're just going to tape those right together. We don't put this on both sides, just on one side, just like that. Then we're able to pick this up and just bend it in half and lay it right there on a roof. And that does an excellent job of holding down this roof material and letting it set up and uh, get nice and strong. It works very great. Now while that's, that's drying, and we again we want to let this dry overnight, um, what I'm doing is here is I'm cutting ordinary tissue paper into strips about one inch wide. Now the kind of tissue paper I'm using here, this is Kleenex, and it's actually double thick tissue so we're going to uh, pull these apart here shortly so you can see we get uh, two strips on each cut. Now this is using tissue paper which is very flexible. Now here the roof has dried overnight. And what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be putting the, the, the tissue paper on here so I've cut it into lengths of approximately three or four inches and we're going to start at the bottom. Now rather than covering this whole wooden surface with glue, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put the tissue on there and then I'm just going to put a little mark right where the edge of that tissue is going to be. Then I join uh, these little marks and what I'm doing is I'm actually putting this glue all around the edge of where this tissue is going to go all around the edge rather than covering the whole thing. Now on some of our later treatments we'll cover the whole thing but on this one this is a little variation that I use. Uh, uh, you can use it for different techniques on different things. 
but here I'm just gluing down just the edge of this and what this does is this leaves the tissue uh, rather loose so that when we do some later work with it, it it leaves it free to bunch up and clump in areas and that's something I notice with this hot mop roofing that happens is the tar and everything clumps up so there we just get that smooth all the way around and put a little bit right in the middle not the whole thing but just little areas nothing nothing in particular just a little bit of areas there and what happens is when we put our paint on here later the part that has the glue the tissue that has the glue in it is going to absorb the paint differently so now we take that first strip and we're just going to put it right into place and we're going to be fairly careful but you don't have to be a hundred percent accurate on this I'll make sure it's covered uh, tricky to work with and just work it with your finger there it sticks well where the glue's already in there but see this clumps up can you see it clumps up a little bit instead of being perfectly smooth okay now you get that first piece on now this is important you let it dry and I'm, I'm, I'm rolling my finger there to roll off the excess uh, glue that's there because I don't really want that excess glue uh, getting involved with the next layer. I want that to lay pretty flat. Okay, See how easy that is? Now I let that dry. Now here I'm not letting it dry for the purpose of the video of course. But uh, once you get that piece done then you, you do the next area and we're going to do it exactly the same way. I'll glue it along the edges. Overlap that first piece a little bit. Not an awful lot. But we're going to overlap it a little bit. Okay little bit of glue there get our next piece of tissue and we're going to put it into place again if you get a little bit of the glue on it or different areas that's okay and again we're just rolling it into a position like that. This is more to smooth the glue out than anything else but there's going to be clumps in that tissue this way of doing it, there's just naturally going to be clumps. And eventually we'll trim off that piece there at the end. Oh, we'll go ahead and trim it off now. Okay, and we let that dry thoroughly. Then we continue to work our way up the building, uh, just adding more. And that's what we're going to do next is we're just going to put another piece there and do exactly the same type thing. Now we want our joints between these pieces so that they're not over the other joints. So we're going to put that piece right there. I'll glue that on just like that. Again, I'm marking it so I know where it goes and then I'll, I'll put the glue on. Okay. Mark right along the edge where that piece is going to go. And we just put the glue in that whole area there, right around the edges of where this particular piece is going to fit into place. We'll get a little bit better view of that here shortly. Okay, now we get our tissue paper. Just want to make sure we get all the right areas here. Never be in a big hurry to do anything. It's easy to be impatient when building models, but I always want to take the time to do things right. Uh, the old adage of the longest journey starts with one single step is true with model building. There, we just put that piece on, smooth it out just like we've done. Need a little more glue to go right there. I didn't quite get it right to the edge properly. Okay, and just tap it into place. Continue working with it like that. 
and we just work right up to the very top of the building when we do that. Okay, so we're just making good progress there. And here we see I've got it all the way at the top. Now what I do, so I've got it on both sides finished up like this, so I'm going to put a strip right across the top. And for this it's easiest just to run the glue right along uh, using your glue container. spread the glue out like this. Of course you could use this any place instead of just using the thing, but I'm just trying to get some progress made here for the purpose of this video. Okay, got that piece on there. And we're just going to lay a strip across right. It's going to go right over the top of the roof. just like that and I'm going to press it down into place both sides I want to make sure we get it so it covers I had it off centered a little bit try again I want to make sure it covers all the way on both sides yeah, just get it into position and just use your finger to press it out. Finger gets pretty sticky at this point. Now here you can see it's completely dried. I've let this dry overnight and you can see the areas how it's different. And here I'm using real thin black paint. I've got the bottle of thinner there on the right so I stick the paintbrush into the thinner then into the paint and then up to the model so it goes on very very thin. Notice also to the left of my bottle of black paint, I've got some brown paint. So what I'm actually going to do is mix a little bit of that brown in here. Now this is very thin. This is very watery. So rather than really painting everything, this is really just the, the paper absorbing this paint. And if it goes on too light, you just add a little bit more to it. And just working from the top, you work your way down alternating between the paint and the thinner whatever combination it takes in order to keep this thin. You can't brush too hard against this because this tissue will tear. So what we're really doing is a very soft brush and we're really letting the, 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 the tissue itself really absorb the paint and pull the paint out of the brush. So I'm painting, pushing the brush against it now there I picked up a little bit of that brown and that brown mixed in with the black just makes for a nice dirty look to it. A little more black, a little more brown and we just work until we got all this tissue completely covered. Very straightforward, very easy thing to do. Now you may find that where you live that you don't relate to this type of uh, roof. If that's the case, well we have other versions we're going to be showing you here shortly. But just wanted to show you how this particular version is done. Now at this particular point here, we've got this just about all done. We just go ahead and paint both sides using this same technique. Now here I've let it dry overnight. And here I'm using some light tan uh, acrylic paint. This is uh, the particular color is not really important. Just so it's a light, very light tan color. And here we mix up, uh, I've got a real watery batch of it. I've got a little plastic container here with a drop of this stuff in. Real watery. And again, this is dried overnight, so don't do this over the wet paint. And just put this on real thin and watery, like this. Very thin. All this is a 
looks very much like a white here but it's really the contrast between it and the black that makes it look this way we just brush this on very thin very thin coat and let it pool up where it wants to pool up along the bottom it will always pool up a little more so we want to lift it from there and then notice we start at the top and then we just brush straight down we don't really want it to go running off the roof we want to control it so we're putting very small amounts on here but it is very thin paint and we're not trying to cover it completely in any certain way we want that real splotchy look to it we're just letting it sort of seek its own level again starting at the top our strokes are always up and down we never really we don't do it in circles we don't do it in angles we try to follow the way the the, the dirt and the grime would develop in real life. It would flow down from the top. It would be in vertical stripes. So that's what we want to do here. And we just want to continue to put small amounts of paint on here. Run the brush over along the bottom edge every once in a while because the paint will pool up along that bottom edge. Okay. Just continue on until we get this covered. very easy that doesn't take any great length of time now what we want is we want very light coats of color here so that we can come back over later and add more color coats if you want okay a very light color and a lot of this is going to disappear when it dries we're just going to get a nice model gray color so we turn over and we do exactly the same thing on the other side now here you can see a little bit of the texture there in that material and if you've ever been up on the roof of a building that's covered with hot tar that's had 15 coats of hot tar on it, you certainly recognize that. And that's a look that uh, next door to me is an old auction barn. It, uh, we used to have auctions in that thing and it was built during World War II as an uh, army barracks and got moved out here. We're seven miles from the army base got moved out here in the 50s and the early 60s and I've worked around that building since 1970 so for 35 years I've been crawling around on this building and I've seen lots of coats of tar put on it and I sure know what that roof looks like and this is what we're going to end up with is something that looks just like if we went and climbed up on that roof and looked at it today Now again, be sure that you're not painting it uh, with real strong colors. This, these are real thin washes. It shows up well now because of the contrast between the light color and the black. But when it dries, it's going to be muted down quite a bit. And I'm just continuing to show you this so that you can really see how thick the paint is. You know, you can tell by the way I brush it on just how thick it is. You come across the bottom, it flows along to that bottom edge. See there on the left how that white is building up along that bottom edge. Uh, we don't want it to do that. We want to pick that up from there. And then once we get it to the way we want, we let it dry and soak it out of our brush like that. And then we can come right back and lift up some of that liquid that's right along the bottom. Any place where it's uh, it's really pooled up bad. You may want to just soak it up with a dry brush, just like I'm doing there. Okay. Get it just the way you want. And of course, we're going to let this dry. We're going to let this dry thoroughly overnight. See how it looks the next day right now it looks pretty messy and yucky again I don't know if you have this type of uh, roof finish around your house but uh, certainly pretty common around where I live there's how it looks after it's dried you know the dark gray with lots of colors from uh, the water and the dirt that's been washed down over the years over it pools up in certain areas the different layers of tar clumps up in others. Now we're going to add a smokestack or any type of vent. So you just take an X-Acto knife, determine where you want it, and just start 
worming the exacto knife around cutting a hole right into the roof like this just cut right into it and we just want that piece to fit in there gotta get it big enough for it to fit in there a little bit yeah okay now just make it a little bigger and we want to smooth out the inside of that and for that we're going to use a round rat tail file okay now when we use our round rat tail file we want to hold it straight up and down as we work up and down to make enough room and just continue doing this till you think you got it right and then take your piece of tubing and stick it in there and see if it's going to fit just right okay now I'll just cut a little piece of uh, styrene, thin styrene, into a shape that's going to serve as flashing and put a mark on it where you want uh, your uh, smokestack to come through and worm it out a little bit with uh, an X-Acto knife just to get a hole in it and just keep test fitting and working with it and then take that same rat tail file and run it back and forth and until you get the hole just right Okay. once you've determined where it goes we're going to mix up a little bit of epoxy this two-part epoxy anytime you use epoxy the real secret is is to stir it and mix it very thoroughly this is five minute epoxy so you got quite a bit of time but just continue to mix it roll it off of your your instrument I'm using a toothpick here and we just put that on the back of that that flashing don't want it on there so thick that uh, uh, it oozes out all over the place around it but we want it on there enough that it'll stick on there real good and then just put it up in place on our structure right over that hole line it up Okay, that gives us our flashing for our stovepipe. The flashing is there, of course, to protect the area around it. And just run that rat tail file through there. After this is dried, this is set up completely now. Run it through there a little bit, and we want to just make sure that our bit of tubing fits in there just right. And once we get that to where it fits just right, I'm going to mix up another batch of epoxy. And we're going to use the epoxy to glue the tubing in place there. Again, stir it very thoroughly. Take the time to stir it very thoroughly. Get it very well mixed. And just put it right around the bottom of your stovepipe. Okay, I'm just getting it all the way around so it's uniform all the way around. And here's one of those areas where you might want to sort of figure out how long it takes for everything to set up because you want to put it into place and you want to hold it into place. See, so I'm just worming it around there and just getting it all into there. Now, unfortunately, you got to sit there until it sets. <laughs> After that's set up, we're just taking some silver paint, painting the whole thing silver. We're also going to paint the flashing silver. You know, and do this pretty carefully so you don't get much onto the, the black material around. If you get a little bit on there, that's going to be okay because we're going to cover that up. So we begin by just painting it with. Uh, the particular silver paint I use is testers. I like those little bottles of testers paint. I've used them for years and I understand the how thick they are and how much it takes to cover and everything. And we're just getting a silver coat on everything here. Now we don't want it to look brand new. We want it to look like this smokestack has been used for a very long time.
So what we're going to do is we're going to mix a few other colors in there with it. We're going to put a little black on there, run some black down. Notice it'll blend right in with the silver. So just keep adding black until you get the amount you want on there. And then you want some rust colors. A rusty brown, a, a rusty red, whatever color looks like rust to you. You want it to add it on and you just want this whole thing to look like it's just a lot of grease or something you know I don't know if you've ever seen grease uh, on an old style of restaurant and it can be very messy so we just assume they use this for cooking and they cooked a lot of a lot of bacon and a lot of animal fats and a lot of grease has come out of this over the years and just use these different earth colors, rust colors, and the silver and the black, and let them mix together. And when you get it all painted, you just let it dry thoroughly. Now, what we're taking here is this is acrylic black paint, which is full strength. It's not thinned down. I'm using just using a toothpick, and I'm going around and I'm just using this to represent hot tar that would have been used to seal right around the edge of this. And I'm using this full strength without toning it down. And we just want to put it all the way around the edge of this and it actually builds up. This acrylic paint's pretty thick and it builds up just like the actual hot tar would build up. So that's how we seal around our smokestack. Very easily done. Looks very nice when it's done. A nice easy way to do something like a stack. Now we're going to work on the sign for the front of the building. Lots of different ways of doing signs, of course, and what I did here was I just printed this out on uh, my printer. And I'm just putting it on a piece of wood. I've got the piece of wood there. i got some rubber cement, and I'm actually going to use the rubber cement to put this on. So you just brush the rubber cement on the wood where you want your sign to go set your sign since it's on paper it sticks very well to that and we want to use uh, something to press that down so we can use uh, just the side of uh, an exacto knife just roll it back and forth like this to force that sign down you can also use the rubber cement bottle and this has the advantage you can peel this off later if you want to change it it's very easy to remove this after that's set to just a few minutes, it dries very quickly. You want to cut it carefully with a sharp knife. Again, this is one of those areas where you want to use a sharp knife, not a dull knife. And several light cuts. And just turn it around and we're going to do exactly the same thing on the other. Just using a straight edge. Figure out how big you want your sign to be. and just line it up very carefully and using light cuts you cut first through the paper and then through the wood underneath you can use dry transfers you can use decals you can use ready-to-made signs you can cut signs out of magazines there's all kinds of sources of them but I just uh, come up with this design using my word processing I use Microsoft Word there's a part on there called word art a little hard to find but you can find it and it allows you to uh, have these arched signs and I just wanted an arch signs so we just align our straight edge up along the edge of that sign. Get that straight and then when we cut across the end like this it's going to give us a, a 90 degree cut. Again anytime you cut through something like this don't try to cut it by pressing down really hard but make several light cuts. 
do exactly the same thing on the other end of the sign. Determine where you want it to go. You want it to be even, so you put a little mark so you can tell where you're going to make your cut at. And line your steel straight edge up. A little straight edge I use I've had for many years. I've got a couple of these. I sell them through Walther's. They're made by General. Most people use them. They're very common, very handy. And that gives us a nice nice little sign with just a very few minutes of work put on it. Now I've got a little stringy part there I want to trim to get off. Yeah. Get it nice and neat. There's this little sign we're going to use for the, the front of the building. The nice thing about using a, the computer and a word processor to do this is you can get that sign to be just the size you want so it fits just right. Now, I like the looks of individual boards, so I'm going to put some marks on here so that I can cut this so it looks like this sign is going to be made out of individual boards. Yeah, I've cut it into thirds, put the marks on both ends. Using any of the different rules there, you generally find one that you can calculate how big to make those cuts pretty easy. Put marks at both ends, line it up with your steel edge right along there. And once again, just pressing lightly, make several cuts. And just cut right through that sign. Very easily done. You don't have to cut all the way through. If you don't want, you can just cut part of the way through. What I do there is I actually put the blade in the holes that I made as marks and press the metal blade uh, ruler up against it so I can make the cuts. There, I've cut it not all the way through, but so it looks like it's three different boards. And then you can take a nice sharp uh, blade, the front or the back. I use the front working with paper here, otherwise it'll just tear. And you're just putting lines through it. Uh, a disadvantage of using paper and things like this is when you put stain on it, uh, the paper swells enough generally to sort of hide these marks you're putting in here. So this is one of those things that sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But it's just uh, just shows you a way of making a, a quick and easy sign to put on your structure. Here I'm just scoring it with uh, the razor knife. Just roughing it up a bit. Getting out my, my stains that I use for the rest of the building. And just going to wash some stain right across there. Now here's a little sample of it to experiment with to see how it's going to look. Make sure your density is the way you want it to look and the color is going to look okay. And once you're satisfied that that's going to be okay, then you just touch it to it and you sort of let it go into those uh, lines as best you can. Let it sort of work in there. But paper's so porous, it's generally just going to absorb all over. So really hard to stain. So as of what I did, I ended up saying, well, I'd just put it all over there. And I added a little bit of brown. Looks pretty dark here, but when you see it a little later, you'll see that it, it lightens up quite a bit. So we take our finished sign. I actually lay it on the front of their building. Now I'm counting the boards there counting those boards to make sure that I get it centered. We want to make sure we have the same number of boards on each side. And we just want to look at it a bit. Get it centered top and bottom the way you want it. And when you do that, you're ready to go ahead and put it into place. Now 
I'm moving it down just a little tiny bit below where I want it. Just putting a little top of drop of glue there and there. Then I'll move that up. Okay, doing the same thing from the other end. Put a little drop of glue at the bottom. That way I can just slide it down now. Make sure I got enough there to hold it in place. Slide it down into position. Once you get it into position, of course, you let it dry. And make sure you got it straight. I guess in real life there's a lot of crooked signs. But it looks better if it's just right. So you just fiddle with it till you get it just so. Then let it dry. Okay, so there's our sign. Now I've cut little pieces of wood and painted them black. Put some glue on them. These are going to go right around the sign to make it stand out a little bit. Just very small pieces of wood. Put one over here on the right hand side that's exactly the same height as the sign. I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. A little bit of glue. Put this piece on there. I want to make sure that it's cut so that it's exactly the same height as the sign. Line those up. And we're going to take a longer piece that uh, goes over the top and one that goes over the bottom. And these are going to be the right length in order to fit there. Very easy to do. This adds nice contrast. It's the same color as I used as the lettering on the sign. With a computer you can do all kinds of ornate signs if you want ornate signs. I had really looked around for a picture of some animal I could put up at the top of here. Uh, but I didn't find anything. I wanted a moose's head or something like that or an eagle's head and I uh, didn't find anything right away and I didn't want to spend a lot of time because I wanted to get on with uh, building this building. Just all kinds of interesting signs you can put on structures for sure. So we just glue that on and again we let that dry very thoroughly. Make sure you got it all just right. Let it dry and it gives you a nice, nice finished sign for the front of your building. You can see that the stain is quite a bit lighter now that it's dried. It's not nearly as dark as it was. Now while I'm here I want to add just a little bit more trim on this building. I want to add another little trim piece up here. So this is another piece of wood that I've painted white and cut and want to glue it on here. Just like we'd put trim work on here before but I just wanted to add a little extra trim on here to, to make it look good. You have a choice. You can have it overhang or not overhang. Your choice. Cut the piece to fit exactly the same on the other side. Beveled on that end, square on the other end. And just put a little bit of glue in place to hold that in place. Little things like this that you can add to your, your structure just uh, improve the appearance an awful lot. Lots of different things you can do with trim work on these buildings. You can make it fairly plain like this one is, or you can get really carried away with it and very ornate. Building was built at a time in real life in which ornate fronts were very popular. Didn't cost an awful lot to add these little doodads. And for us it helps with that roof line to sort of hide the edge of that roof there. Since we put that tar paper on there, that hot mop roof, we can uh, go back and just add this on and uh, just help a little bit. And with the uh, brighter wood, you can leave this white wood the, the way it is for a little uh, uh, extra color, or you can tone it down to match. 
whatever you want to do is what you should do it is your building now both ends of this are tapered so it fits well there at the bottom and so it fits there at the top as well Learning exactly how much glue to put on so that it holds well but it doesn't show is something that only experience can teach you. But it gets to the point where it's second nature to you and you just instinctively know after a while just how much to use in each area in order to make it work well. Just fidgeting to get it lined up just right. And same thing on the other side. We just want it to line up very carefully. Add a little bit of glue. Put that into place. And a little on the piece itself. You can add little strips of wood hanging down from the front of this uh, to add other ornamentation to it. Lots of different things can be done to these little structures to give them a little extra flair and we just push that into place now we're gonna, we're gonna be working on the foundation we'll be working on the foundation for this so I guess you could call it the platform or the foundation if you start with the original plan that you had there well you got one dimension that's going to be right already so you just sort of lay your building down on it and figure out how long that's going to be and just mark it lightly with your pencil and just figure out about how far out you want it to go if you want a porch on it uh, we'll just have the porch extend that amount right there very easy to calculate sort of eyeball just what's going to look right on this porch for you and you just pick it up and uh, take your straight edge and extend that whichever those lines you want to use just extend them over following the graph paper and then you can just uh, bring your marks down alongside the building this is going to give you a foundation that your building is going to fit onto exactly cut the line drawn there and we want to draw one on the other side of course exactly the, the same way Now when we're actually calculating how long we want our pieces of wood to be cut, I'm taking these two pieces of wood there. And those are going to be the outside parts of our uh, our foundation. So I was just, just thinking about making sure how big I want to make these lines and everything. So this is going to be drawn right along there. And here's how we cut our wood. We just lay it on there and cut it cut two pieces exactly the same length now for the cross pieces that go in between for this now our foundation for this we're not going to build this accurate according to building code we're, we're figuring nobody's going to pick it up and look at the bottom of it so I just line those two pieces up for my outside piece and take the piece here that goes in between and cut it to that length and that way it's going to be just right. So I've got several pieces there and I just stain them the way I want them to be stained and then I just start gluing these cross pieces on there. Just like that. And once you do that you want to make sure these are square. You can glue this on a piece of graph paper or you can just use different things to square these up this is a pretty basic type of uh, structure very easy to square these up so I'm just uh, putting my handy dandy cutting device there hold it in place and putting one gluing a piece over on the other side
by putting it right at the very end and another piece of wood I can hold that piece of wood up there and that'll ensure that I have a straight edge across there just bring that piece up right up against it and that's a good way to square your whole little little basic foundation area up is to do it that way now once you've got that squared up of course what you want to do is you want to let it dry and just make sure it's square at the other end too so that the end pieces and everything just are fine you put it right at the end and just if this is not square everything else is going to be off so you do want this to be nice and square now here I've got the other cross pieces I've set them up how many I'm going to use there and I just uh, lay them at the end of the wood and then calculate that along my ruler measure along on my ruler and see what the number is there and can divide it so that I can see just how wide apart to, to make these pieces when I put them into pay, place. Of course again we're not uh, doing this for a contest or anything where somebody's going to be picking up and examining uh, the, the, the cross pieces on your foundation or anything like that so uh, we want it to be reasonably accurate but we're not too too terribly concerned about it the reason we want it to be even though is when we go to add our flooring it'll make our flooring a lot easier if we're able if we do keep it even so whatever the figure is we just want to go along and put marks there I'm putting these marks right on the wood rather than on the the surface underneath I'm putting it right on the wood so that I can line these uh, floor beams or braces joists I guess is the correct term these floor joists up so that uh, they line up correctly and you want to put these marks on both sides of course of, on both pieces of wood then they're ready to just drop into place and glue into place drop them in to make sure it looks right sometimes I make these calculations and I find out I didn't really do it accurately so it helps to sometimes to just take the time to put them in there and see how it looks okay making my marks pretty clear there making sure everything is even counting out to make sure my spacing is correct I want to do the same thing over on the other side make sure everything is correct so I'm putting little marks here using this black felt tip pen just to make sure that I get it all accurately done like I say this will speed up the work on the floor quite a bit you'll see shortly why we need to have these evenly spaced and of course you put a little bit of wood on there to uh, a little weight on there so it dries nice and flat now this is dried completely so this is the next day I'm working on this here I'm just putting some beads of glue straight across there not going all the way across just about a third of the way because what I'm using here is I'm using wood that's going to be uh, different lengths I've cut to different lengths so it will fit exactly on different uh, pieces of wood so I put my my building plate there so I can put my first piece right up against it now the kind of wood that I'm using actually is coffee stir sticks I don't know if you can find these locally in your place or not but uh, you know places like uh, well coffee shops have these uh, real cheap nice little pieces of wood work great for planks they're crooked they're they're bent they're warped um, but for flooring that's an ideal type thing for a structure then we just cut them to different lengths so the first one we push right up against that edge there so that it's it's solid right at the end then this next one here's why our our joists had to be cut just right so I could take these different length pieces like this and just drop them into place like this 
So I used a long one, then a shorter one, and a shorter one. Then do a long one, and a shorter, and that way we got a pattern going across there. If any of them are warped too badly, just set it aside and use it for something else. But these floors were pretty crudely put together. This was heavy wood. It was not refined wood. It, uh, they saved all the good stuff for building the walls and everything. And the floors were just out of really coarse, rough cut wood. Okay, so we just continue gluing these pieces on here like this. Now notice I've got those pieces extending beyond and I'm going to cut those off after this dries. So a little piece and longer piece and longer piece. Just a nice easy way of building up this floor in a hurry. You can use scribe siding for this. You can anything you want. I just like doing it this way. And I like using these cheap pieces of wood because of the fact that they do have a lot of grain to them and they're distorted and everything and it just uh, makes for a nice look. And of course we just continue progressing right across doing it this way. Now after we get this all completely done across here, we turn it over, put some weight on it, and let it dry thoroughly. Now once it's dried thoroughly, we're ready to come back and we're ready to cut these pieces off on the end and we just trim across the end. Having to hold it this funny way so you can see what I'm doing because otherwise my hands just get in the way there. We'll do it this way. I can get it actually cut through this way. This is hard wood. This is not this is not basswood. This is I think they make this stuff out of pine. Whatever it is, it's a lot harder, a lot harder to cut through. But we're still able to cut through it pretty good. And the last few are always a little tough to get through. Okay, there's our basic floor for our structure. And our structure is just going to fit right on there like that. It's going to be very easy to do. That's going to give us our floor for the inside, and that's also going to give us a porch as well. Sometimes they would build the porch on as an afterthought. Sometimes they would plan the porch and build it this way. Now we want to make sure that our ends are very even here, our sides are very even on this. Because we're going to add a little more siding material onto here. So we just want to cut along here and make sure this is very flush on both sides. Just cut off this extra material here. Okay. Just want to make sure that's really smooth along there. Really smooth and take our emery board and sand it just so it, it's smooth because we want it to match our walls exactly. So we just get this as smooth as we possibly can right along here. Okay, there's our wood. And now we uh, think about it and uh, what we might want to do. It's okay to have it a little jagged along the front. That's okay. Uh, the end at the back, though, we want it to be smooth, too, because we're going to have some siding material coming down over there. So along our back, we want it to be smooth, just as our side walls were. Again, we're going to be adding some more siding material onto here, so it has to match the stud arrangement on our walls uh, just perfectly. Now it's a good time to put some uh, nail holes in here. 
there's enough gaps there you can actually see through there by not putting those boards hard up against each other you can actually see where those pieces are underneath and uh, you can actually see where the wood is joined together too so we just want to come across with our ponce wheel and we want to put some nail holes in there it's always a discussion goes on about whether to put nail holes on or not so what we're really trying to do is we're not trying to put nail holes where it's not like we're taking a drill and drilling holes down here we're just breaking the surface of the wood enough so that we only put our stain on it that it will accept the stain differently so that it will give more nail marks I use the term nail holes all the time but that's not that's just the term we use in the hobby and uh, nail marks is uh, uh, a better uh, word to use so I'm just coating this with uh, my brown uh, stain could use the gray uh, the brown just gives the wood a, a nice look you know the floor of a building like this would never be painted it would be raw well, I guess they could paint it, but I don't remember ever seeing any that were painted. So we just want uh, a natural color of the wood to show through, and this gives a, a nice look to it. The stain also goes into the nail holes, the nail marks, excuse me, a little bit, and brings those out. This also shows our individual boards differently. That's You can tell there without any effort that there's variation in the colors just by the differences in the wood. Just want to make sure that that fits on there perfectly, which indeed it does do. Very nice. Okay. There you can see from underneath we want it so it lines up with the studs just right so that we have the siding. It's a little separate there. Okay, now we're gonna, gonna put little bits of glue in here. Not a lot of bit of glue. I'm gonna glue it to the floor. I'm just putting a dot on each side. And this way I can pry this off later if I want to, to detail the interior. Uh, just one little dot of glue in each of the four corners. Line it up very carefully. Very critical to do this just right and then glue it in place and then once this glues and sets up well we're ready to go ahead with the next step of our model okay now we could if you wanted to have uh, you could uh, put a little decking on the side like this in which case the building as we have it done is is done well but along here at the bottom we need to have siding come down and cover over that uh, part of the foundation in real life they would build the foundation first then erect the walls then put the siding on starting with the siding at the bottom so it would overlap that joint sort of like this piece that I'm putting there Now we're not going to have a true overlap now let me illustrate on this other building that I have here uh, see there's no siding put on yet see they would build it this way then they would put this piece on they would put it right at the bottom so it would overlap that joint between the studs and the foundation to keep a uh, rain out so we have to sort of cheat so we're putting a little thin piece on it's not as wide as our siding up above and we're just going to glue it in place around the back and then we're going to glue a piece along on this side and then one on the other side as well we're just doing a little few little touch-up things here on our model at this point there's our little piece that would cover over um, cover over the joint between the studs and the foundation. Now up along here in this area under the roof, you notice I brought the siding up to there but I left this area to the last and that's because and that's one of those areas that we wanted to wait until we actually had our roof on before we started uh, uh, adding that next part on there. So what we're actually going to do, we're actually going to cut some pieces of siding material and glue it up into place in there. These have to be cut. We can put uh, one piece on like that that does a good job. How's that? But that was something we needed to wait until those rafters were on there before we did that. 
So we want to cut these pieces and glue them into place. I'm putting a little mark there. I don't want to use one long piece for this, just like uh, on the rest of the siding. I would like to have a joint along there. I'm going to make sure I've got that mark just right. Sometimes my marks aren't bold enough for me to really see them. Okay, so we just cut that piece. Get a little bit of glue. Glue these pieces up under there. Okay. That way our siding goes right up to where our rafters are. Gives us a nice, good covering of that area there. So that's why we left that open until the very end. Until after we had our roof in place. Until we had our rafters in place. We're getting along pretty close to the end of this uh, segment. Here shortly we'll be ending up this one. I will pretty much have our building all done here, but I do want to do one more, one more disc, just to show some of the variations we can do to uh, add a little more variety to it. But we've done enough here to actually show uh, pretty much the finished model. So there's pretty much our finished model looks pretty good just like that but we're going to go ahead and we're going to do a little more work on this had a lot of fun so far and well we're just going to work on little areas here and we're just going to let a little bit of the Zydeco music come up now and finish off this tape <laughs> <laughs> 